Mm -hmm. Okay, so welcome to the second part of my talk. So I'm going to talk about CSPs, and there's like fixed constant r to k, and then there's a predicate p, which is a subset of f to k, and then you are interested in problem max CSP of p, and then so basically I'm going to prove the following theorem. So um, if p is a pairwise independent subgroup. So I'm not going to repeat the definition of it, but like I'm going to introduce the properties of it as I go through. And which is, I think, equivalent to the P is a subspace with dual distance 3, at least 3. Then for any, for any epsilon greater than 0, there is a eta greater than 0 such that there exists an instance such that opt is uh, at most the trivial density plus epsilon and uh, value of a uh, linear round, eta, time, eta times n rounds of Lasserre hierarchy is a uh, one. So this gives an gap basis. So this is a theorem I want to prove today. Okay. So, so yeah, I'm not gonna like say too much about like predicate, but if like P is a, uh, at least like subgroup or subspace, then what you can do is uh, we can like take each, each constraint, like say C1, and then like we are gonna find like bunch of linear equations, like X, say, something like that, such that like this constraint is satisfied if and only all of these linear equations are satisfied. So these, these linear equations are over F2. So we can do this for every um, constraint. Because it's a uh, like subspace subgroup, and then um, like in the last time, um, so I want to represent like every linear equation. So um, I re represent each linear equation by some just uh, like um, S and Y, where S is uh, just a subset of variables, and there are there are n variables. So this represents the left hand side. So in this case, S is a uh, one, two, four, and y is just a like bit zero, one represents the right hand side. So in this case, it's a, so this is a this equation, and then so this is possible because the p is a um, subspace, and and since it has a dual distance three or a pairwise independent, what I can assume is that. If you look at any like any subset of linear equations that belong to one constraint, so any non-trivial linear equation, so some add like some of the equations, then what you get is uh, some another equation like say like T Z. But unless it's like non-trivial linear combination, um, we know that the size of T is at least three. So this is what um, dual distance three means, and then we're going to use this property. So, and, and we are gonna use a resolution proof system that David talked about. And, but it's, uh, I think it's a slightly different um, because we are dealing with linear equations, which is much nicer. So what we are gonna do is the, that, so we have a bunch of linear equations. We are gonna add all of them to um, some collection phi, all of, initially add all these equations to phi and what we will do is that take two equations and we are going to add these two equations which means that the equation resulting equation will be as symmetric difference t y plus z and then add, add it when the size of S symmetric difference T is at least, at, at most T. I have a quick question. Uh -huh. Is there any particular reason why you're looking at kind of these groups of linear equations that correspond to the predicate? Like, is there any reason why you can't just like look at a set of linear equations with good expansion? Sorry? Um, so is this is this any more general than just me saying you have a list of linear equations and they have good expansion? 
Um, yes, actually, so I'm gonna, yeah, so if like each of them has a good expansion, then you're, you're gonna be perfect. But like we are gonna use a kind of weaker fact that like each of these constraints, if each of these constraints have a good expansion, then we are also in a good shape. But then you have this, this um, pairwise dependence property, which and you're saying any non-trivial linear combination of these sums, you know, you add them up, you have at least three variables, which is also an expansion property. Yes. In a sense. So I'm wondering if this is any more, yeah, if it's any more general than just like expansion on the overall hypergraph of a set of linear equations. I don't fully understand your question. Good. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm saying not really sure what you mean by expansion of a set of constraints. Yeah. Yeah, so, so if you think about, because I, I think, yeah, yeah, so that is. So I think um, like, yeah, so you, I mean, probably yeah, you can like think of each like linear equation as like constraint. You can think of, or you can think of, well, just think of it as there's a corresponding, you know, it's a hypergraph, a corresponding hyper edge, and you know, you have edge one to four. Mm -hmm. You know, there's expansion of this thing. Or expansion is, uh, you know, it's the, this, um, I think like they are like in some sense equivalent. Probably what you're saying is like kind of like syntactically even stronger, but actually like, but I think I mean, there will be like more or less equivalent. I'm gonna use this. I guess, I guess I'm just trying to understand why, why you phrase this way. It's just saying instead of saying I have a set of linear equations. Okay. That, that's my, that's my, that's really my question. Okay. Yeah. Probably. I, uh, so yeah. I mean, I just did it because like yeah, I wanted to like focus on CS. I, I just initially started from like CSP, which is like P is very sparse. So it, He's in, in like you, naturally, you, yeah. You're looking at the most general thing you can look at under this, uh, yeah, yeah. this set. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. That makes sense. I mean, yeah, if you like, if you're like predicate is just x or y, then actually there's like one like linear equation for each constraint, actually, then you can do like things. Sure. So, so this is a resolution proof system. So, this like t is called the width of the resolution proof system. And we have a contradiction. Contradiction. When we derived um, empty set and one here. Okay. And. and what, what are S and T? Sorry? Uh, what are S and T? So S and T, so I just, um, from last week, I represented each linear equation as a, this like tuple S and Y, where like S is a subset of variables and then Y is a. And then, so like these are two equations, and then if you add them, then like the resulting equation can be represented as like this, as symmetric difference t because like the intersection cancel out. And then, so this is a new equation we derive, and then we are going to add it to the phi when this um, this width, I mean the support is still small, and then we get a contradiction if we basically derive the zero is equal to one here. So then I actually like, um, so my talk will be like, have two parts. So first part is that for any epsilon greater than zero, there's a eta greater than zero such that there is an instance such that opt is a still small. And it cannot be refuted by resolution proof system with, with like eta times n. So that's the first part of the talk. So theorem one. So let me um, introduce some like notations that's really related to what David said. So given an instance, an instance, we say that, so first one is, uh, we say that it is uh, RL expanding. So usually R will be omega of n, R will be linear, and then L is uh, some like number between zero and k. When any set of R constraints cover um, R times L variables. Just a sanity check. How hmm. many equations will there be in total? It's not just, it will be linear in N, but. Yes. Uh, how, 
how will it depend on the size of p? Is it like n times size of p? I think yeah, like if like t is a t is a subspace, then this number of equations is a co-dimension of p. Oh, okay. yeah. So that's the first defi definition. And then the second definition is that I'm gonna call like R L boundary expanding. If any set of R constraints exactly cover exactly cover R times L variables. So exactly cover mean, means that like each variable is covered by exactly one constraint. So these are two definitions. And, and is it like at least R times L variable or exactly R times L? R at least, well, everything is at least. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, let me give you some examples. So if you have a like, so like these dots are variables, and then like these are, they are constraints. I mean, this this is not uniform. Okay. <laughs> if you have this 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 example, then like number of variables covered is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, thirteen. Thirteen variables are covered, but um. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten variables are exactly covered. So, in this, um, if this is the whole instance, then this is a this is a um, four thirteen over four expanding, and then like four. 10 over 4 boundary expanding. Okay, so that's the. You really got lazy with boundary. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you have to check all the subsets? Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't check it, yeah. Okay. You're right. <laughs> Might not be. <laughs> There's just a. Yeah, what what do you mean? That's a for all subsets. Yeah, like, so every, every, every subset of R constraints oh, the have, the yeah, yeah, has yeah, to expand. But that was the entire constraint set right there. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I just assumed no, that. Two, like, like they have. Hey, is there any set of any set of R constraints has, have to cover at least? Is it exactly R or like? No, like up to yeah. Sorry. Sort of, yeah. Oh, most R. Oh, okay. yeah. There we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Sorry. Yeah. Me, wait, wait. Any uh, any set of at most any uh, set of K at most R constraints covers at least K times all variables. So L is a number between like zero and K. All, all I'm saying is, if I look at one constraint. Uh -huh. Should it cover R times L variables or just L variables? Yeah. It, now, R it, it R contains like exactly K variables. Mm. What was your question? My question is, if I'm like a million comma two expanding, uh -huh. and then I look at a con one constraint, uh -huh. a set of one constraint, mm -hmm. do I have to cover two million variables? Just just two, two, va two variables. Oh, OK, sorry. Yeah, it's like okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There are any set of like r prime less or equal to r yeah. constraints cover at least r prime. Oh, I see. Okay. You're right. You're, right. you're absolutely right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so like yeah, at the end we're gonna take a random like hypergraph, random instance. So we can like basically like do some semi check um, to see what will be the worst L. So. I mean, L will be exactly the, the minimum distance of the thing, right? Like, you can't make it smaller than the minimum distance. Minimum distance? Actually, like, I, L in this definition, small. I forget every, like, I forget okay. linear constraints. I, I forget linear equations. Here, I only talk about the constraints ah, without carrying this linear. About this. Okay. Yes, Great. I'm just, so I think, so, I mean, if, like, there are many constraints which overlap a lot, but then it's gonna be like very less expanding, but in random graph, that's not gonna happen. So actually, uh, we are gonna be interested in a um, case where the number of, number of constraints is linear in number of variables, so which is like very sparse. So among these natural things, so probably like in terms of expanding, probably like one of the worst case is uh, like many constraints share the same variable. So in this case, um, x, like L is a roughly like k minus one. Mm -hmm. So it's just like in some intuition, like seeing and which. This is worst case. No, he's just saying here's a. Here's like some example oh, that. So yeah, yeah. So case. I mean that that worst case, yeah. So this means that we can't.
hope like significantly better than K minus one for L. Oh, so we're hoping that L is like really really close to K. Yeah, I mean really close to K minus one because like K minus one will be ruled out by this example. So any like random hypergraph will have like these constraints like sharing one variables. Oh, I see. And then like so this satisfies that like L cannot be more than K minus one. And then for boundary expanding, so like one example I got is a uh, like something like this. So, sorry, uh, sorry for stopping you, but like, I, I forgot what is. Oh, k is the arity. Yeah, k is the arity. Oh, okay, so yeah. that's the number. Of, so yeah. yeah, all these examples, k is probably four. Yeah. I see. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. So if we do this, then um, then for boundary expanding, so we can't like hope like much bigger than k minus two, which is kind of intuitive. But actually, and then, but we can um, prove that actually these are the, basically the worst case. So like there's a lemma such that for any, for any epsilon greater than zero, delta greater than zero. And then, so. Just trying to understand where the k minus 2 k comes from. Those examples. Well, you know, so there are 16 dots total. Yes. Yes. Uh, no. How many dots are there? Uh, there are 16. <laughs> 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 and how many? There are 12 that are uniquely covered. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, L would be. Uh, Less than four <laughs> because there are five of these, right? Yeah, so I'm gonna guess it's like what's in this 3.2. 3 3 3. Is it 3.4? 3. 3. 4, 3. 4. In any case, so we're just trying to work out why is it k minus two in that example? Oh, here, yeah, I so like number of elements that are exactly covered is k times k minus one, and then you divide it by there are like k plus one constraints, so I thought it was like k minus two. It could be, just let me... For like large k. Yeah, that's what k minus 2 is. Well, the whole point is that um, when k is a constant, then this is like a constant size subgraph. So it will always happen, or it will happen with high probability so long as yeah, it's yeah, large. Yeah. You can have like a lot of copies of it. I mean, actually, I mean, you can, you can take an arbitrary constraint and then actually, so if they over, overlap, and then actually it's going to even hurt like expansion. So. So you can take one constraint, which is backbone of this picture, and then you can take like for each variable, you can take like any constraint instead of on this constraint. So if like these constraints overlap, then actually we are in a better shape in like because like it gives a less expansion. But well, I mean, we want more. We want less expansion. The, the more no. Yeah, we want. I mean, yeah. The less expansion we get, the happier we are. Yeah. He's saying this is an upper bound on what we can expect. Or at least that's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, yeah, forget about the, I mean, forget about the examples. Like, they are, they actually, like, they are not very important. So, so like. I So, what I'm, yeah, why I'm, I try to say is that, like, for any, like, random instance, you can, like, find the, like, struct, sub, um, subset of constraints like this, which satisfies that if, like, if, if, this instance is a RL boundary expanding, then the value of L cannot be like much greater than K minus two. Oh, I guess I won't get any, yeah, the odds of this thing is like some one over N. Well, so it, it, decays it, of it N. depends on the, well, it depends on the number of variables relative to the number of constraints. Because right. if, say you want to choose this, how do you choose it? You have the number of, the number of ways you can, you can make one of these things is to kind of throw variables in each of the variable slots. Yeah, yeah. And then divide by the total number of variable clause slots. Right. I forgot about and, the dividing part. And so, and so, yeah. So it depends on essentially the expansion, how many of these things will occur. But all you have to do is get one to occur, and then boom. Yeah, and you just do this little calculation, you'll see what happens. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So this is lemma. So there's a like instance such that like opt is like very trivial, but like is a very large expanding. So it's like expansion is close to this k minus one. Then boundary expansion is close to k minus two. Even though it's slightly less than that. One more question. 
here that you're in the process of approving. This is by Gregoriev slash Schoenbeck, or this is prior to them? Um, actually, I didn't look at Grigoriev, so I just looked at Schoenbeck. But Schoenbeck proves this thing? Um, this one? No, the thing on the left, the big theorem. Yes. I mean, probably yeah, it's, I mean, this, this part is probably like from, this part is really easy. And then this part is from like this Ben Sasson and Richter's paper. This sure proofs are narrow. I, mean, I don't I haven't read this paper either, but like kind of variant of this oh, okay. technique. Okay, so. Yeah, so I'm not going to prove this lemma, but this is a very like easy union bound and okay. counting techniques. So you take like any like assignment. There are two to the n possible assignments, yep. and then like for each assignment, if you like throw many like oh, constraints down, and then and then you take a like turn of bound, and then you take a union bound at the end. Mm, okay. And and so another lemma says that if instance is a instance is bound. Ada n k minus two minus delta expanding boundary expanding for some eta greater than zero delta is greater than zero probably like perhaps less than one over ten then it cannot be refuted by Resolution proof system with with um, eta n over two. So that's the lemma. So let me prove this. So for each equation, so our algorithm, our resolution algorithm was we took like initial phi and then we do the all these possible resolutions and then like be done when we cannot add anything. So for each um, derived equation, so let mu of s of y be the minimum number of constraints used to derive it. So I actually erase a picture, but like each constraint is a, each constraint has a like multiple linear equations. And then like in this definition, we want to use the minimum number of constraints if you choose one constraint, you can use whatever like linear equations in here. But this is a minimum number of constraints that are used to derive this linear equation, S, Y. So this is a definition of mu, S, and Y. And then actually, and then I'm gonna look at another way to derive. So, and then, so that's the definition of mu. And then, so suppose that, suppose that we derive contradiction. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at another way to drive um, this contradiction, which is just follow this definition. So this is that just take two any linear equations and then like add them and then add it to phi. So I'm gonna draw this um, derivation tree. So in the root we have a empty set one, and then like it's a like binary tree, exactly two children, and then so like each like node is uh, just a linear equation in phi, not the constraint. So like at the end, it will be some like basic equation to add, like implied by constraints. So actually, so these are two ways to look at this re resolution proof system. But the only thing I can say is that if you look at two, if you look at just arbitrary node and it's two children, then it's a sub additive. Which is clear because um, if you add these things, then you get this. So this is a one way to drive this. 
but like there are there might be other ways to drive um, the execution merge like more efficiently. So this is not just for root; this is for any node. The sub additivity. You could probably also assume this is totally minimal. Maybe could you do that? Totally. Like I this mean, there's one? no reason not to assume that this one, this tree, or like. Yeah, maybe actually I'll, I'll re-say it. Yeah, uh, you can probably construct a tree where there are qualities all the way down, maybe. But the mu definition doesn't use the fact that the all I'm saying is for width is phi comma one. Oh, no, 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 using because like width. in that case, John, the issue there is like you might like then you end up with something that's not a tree because like maybe I address something I need to use on like both on the left and the right hand side. Um, and if you, because like, oh, you might have to derive it like twice if you want to have like two separate step trees. You probably never need to derive it twice though, because if you, uh, hmm. I feel like if you were to add it on both sides, yeah, maybe you would get it out at the top and maybe yeah. say, well, let's yeah. just take it out and then change it, propagate the. Or I do it above. But I think, I think the definition of mu doesn't use anything but width, whereas we know that this tree at every step has. Okay, yeah, I missed that then. Is that true? Again? What do you say? The mu definition says nothing about the width. Width. Uh, Currently. The mu is just the smallest set of equations that you have to add together to get it. And it doesn't say the smallest set of operations that maintain width of this key? I mean, at least like I don't see an immediate way, and then probably it's not used in the proof. That's but like, you can find it. <laughs> What's the definition of oh, mu? Like, a mu is a, okay, probably, I, yeah. Mu is a, the minimum number of constraints such that SY is derived, as derived, or like SY, is just like linear combinations of the linear equations associated with these constraints. Okay. So there's no, de no, no. Yeah, no, no, there's no width. Yeah. So I'm gonna uh, claim that first, the mu value of those, this root node is at least eta times n, which is eta times n right there. Because, um, so suppose that like there are like mu constraints here, which is used to drive this um, empty set one. But like one property I mentioned about dual distance three is that is that so first of all like each constraint is here for the reason like meaning that it actually gives a like non-trivial linear combination. Otherwise, you can just delete it. That that violates the definition of mu. So each constraint, if you sum these uh, linear equations that participate this derivation um, within this constraint, then like this sum will have another like another linear equation. But we know that its support is uh, at least three. So we can draw something here. So suppose that these three variables are the final contribution of this constraint to the to the derivation. And then probably this constraint are these three things, and this, this constraint are probably these three things. But the fact is that, so the number of constraints is still at most eta times n, which means that it is a k minus two minus delta boundary expanding. And then it means that, so boundary, like, actually if it's a boundary expanding, we can, each constraint, has a, can be associated with the variables that it contains, that it exactly contains. So it means that there exists a constraint that has a, which is unique to him. I mean, actually, yeah, there is a constraint that has at, mo at least came as two elements which are unique to him. So in this, in this example, so this constraint has all three guys unique to him, and then this, 
this guy actually like so every constraint is uh, has actually at least two guys uh, unique to him. So and this number of blue elements are actually um, at least three, okay. and then you have a, a, and there exists a constraint that has at least k minus two variables which are unique to him. So so there exists a constraint. Um, I, I guess you're trying to say that everything has two, yeah. so I can always set. Yeah, yeah. So okay. you can always find the blue thing which is covered exact, exactly once, and then this variable will never never be cancelled out. So this is the picture proof. That, that, so I said that works. It didn't matter. It didn't matter that we had k minus two minus delta. K minus two minus like point nine, you'll be fine. I, any number that's bigger than zero is good there. Any number that that's bigger than k minus three will be fine. Why? I mean, k minus three because here we have k equals three. Yeah, because yeah. we have like three three blue elements wow. for each constraint. Yeah. There will be like. So 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 long as that number is bigger than zero. So long as this this number is bigger than k minus three. Which is zero. I mean, like for. <laughs> yeah. Why so, should it be bigger than k minus three? Oh, so probably yeah. Um, k is three here. No, like k is uh, k is larger than three. So probably not larger, but yeah, k k is at least three. When k. When k is like ridiculously large, yeah. and I still care that's k bigger than k minus three. Yes. Wow. Um, so, so, sorry, sorry. So here's what I thought you were trying to say, but I guess that's not what you're saying, which is that if you had two variables for each constraint, then because this is pairwise independent, I can always set them in such a way that everything can be satisfied. So oh, you need those to equal like the right hand side? No. So like, yeah, that's so what I thought, but you're saying something like, oh, there's two, but they'll never get canceled out. I mean, it's slightly different. Are you trying to say that there are any instances of size data times n is satisfiable? Sorry? Are you trying to say that any substances of size data times n is satisfiable? Satisfiable in a less lesser sense? Uh, just straight satisfiable. No, like, so yeah, let me, let me probably like retry to explain well, yeah. it. Wait, can I say what I was, thought you were trying to say? All we're doing, let me ignore the right hand side. Let me say all we want to do is derive the empty set. Yeah, yeah. Then that means that this set of, this big set of constraints that we have, we're going to add them all together, which means that every variable must be, must occur an even number of times in the constraints. Yes. So if we have any variable that occurs once, yeah. then we're done. Yeah. And so all I need to tell you is that, um, that I have at least one variable which is exactly covered, which is not exactly which is exactly covered. Which is exactly covered. Which is exactly covered. Yeah, but actually, like, but there's like subtle issue because like yeah, we we are not completely using all variables in the constraint, but like probably yeah. So suppose that this is like one like this is mu constraints, but like but each constraint has like many linear equations. But somehow we use only like this constraint, this constraint, this constraint from this oh, constraint. Oh, somehow it thrown away all the. So like yeah, so like this constraint, this constraint, this constraint, this constraint. So like empty set is like sum of all these uh, these things, uh -huh. just a, like subset of a uh, linear equation associated with one constraint. Mm -hmm. But and then I w and then what I said was uh, in each constraint, if you add these participating linear equations in any way you want, you will get something. This linear linear equation, uh, which is a final I said like final contribution of that constraint. Has um, has at least three variables still. So why is that the case? So you're saying that there's some okay. Where you overloading constraints? So I'm going to say linear equation. There's yeah. some constraint. Whose linear equations, when you add them up, yeah. produces at least three variables. That is true for any constraint. Okay. Oh, that's true for any. Any constraint, yes. And I, I said that there's like at least one constraint 
which uniquely covers at least k minus two variables. So if you, if you look at this final contribution of this constraint to the variables that it contains, then there must be at least one blue guy which cannot be canceled. So at the very least, like in the, the super simple case of it's just KXR? Yeah, KXR actually, we don't need to like cons consider all these equations. There, are, there is only one equation, and, and then like... All we're looking, yeah, for KXR, it suffices to prove like... It's like boundary. boundary expanding with, with anything, any, any, any positive. Yeah, any positive, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so you're saying a set of equations, any set of the size eight and a linear equation must be satisfied with X squared. Um, it but he's doing more, I mean, that works with XOR, but then also he's doing yeah. more generally for any, for what's independent. But, so, so, okay, like, why, why does this not work? Because there's at least two in every pair. There's some setting of those two variables such that that constraint will be satisfied. So every set of eta n constraints is always satisfied. Yeah. I think probably you can like carefully choose like order of the constraints. Probably then you can. No, I, I'm saying why does that even matter? Because like once I fix everyone else, since it's pairwise independent. I see. There should be two. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. 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 Some proofs can go like that. Yeah, yeah that's like BGMT way. Yeah, yeah. Make a matching between the variables and the constraints. You can sign like like saying like two variables each constraint. I think. Uh, I think. Wait, if it's pairwise, just so I understand, are you saying that if I'm pairwise in a kind of predicate and then input to it that doesn't set two variables, then there's any, that way, always a way to set two variables that makes it satisfied? That's what I'm thinking. So that's not necessarily true. There's some um, pairwise independent predicates which is like have very small support. That would imply that support is always at least a fourth, right? Because for any way of setting everything else, there's always at least one out of four ways of setting that satisfied as a predicate. Yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So assuming this claim, let me go on. So claim two is a. Uh, so there is a node. There is a equation in phi, such that. So this is a claim, and at least this is easy to prove. So this one was uh, bigger than eta times n, and then it's sub-additive. So if you look at the bigger, bigger shine, then you decrease by at most a factor of two. So claim three. Then actually, s is bigger than eta prime times n for some other constant eta time, eta prime. So this is another claim. What's, what's so if you look at this mu value here, I'm, I'm now using this tree. So mu value here is, a, is at least eta times n. And then they, they are sub-additive. So if you look at, if you are here, then you look at these two children, oh. and then you, yeah, you go to the children with a larger value of the important yeah. point is that this thing is you want a lower bound for the yes. fact that there, you're, you don't care as much about the upper bound. I mean, maybe that matters too, but yeah, like upper bound is used to like use the expansion again. Is what is is it is needed to use the expansion again? Okay. Wait, why why is the upper bound? I mean, so eventually, like, so mu of leaves will be one. All right. And then. Uh, so like it's uh, like it's greater than eta times okay. n, and then we are like. Okay. So yeah, you just you go down. Yeah, this like factor of two is like a. Intermediate value, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something like that, yeah. So. Again, I'm gonna draw the same picture here. I'm gonna recycle this picture, which even though it's just confusing. So actually, it's like it's like the same, same proof, but it's a more quantitative version. So for, for these constraints that are used to derive this um, SY, so we again look at which linear equations are participating. 
and then we are going to draw this blue blue hyper edges again within each hyper edge and so each um, size of the each blue hyper edge is at least three and then so if delta is small I just um, previously I just said there is like a, just one constraint which uniquely covers um, at least k minus two things but now since like delta is a very small constant then we can say that for some like eta eta there will be eta n I mean so for if like value of delta is really small then we can say that constant number constant fraction of these constraints will have at least k minus two uniquely covered elements this just by averaging argument because the maximum is k and then the average is k minus two minus delta so the fraction of things that have at least k minus two is at least constant and then for these guys for the um, for the constraint that has k, at least k minus two things uniquely covered then this blue hyper edge will intersect with the uh, elements that is uniquely covered. So for each such constraint, we get at least one, one variable that will be, never be canceled. And, and that gives this proof. Is the proof clear? So, so I, I, I was with you until you said that there's a constant fraction of these mini hyper edges that have K minus two. Actually, so yeah, yeah, so there are like constant fraction of like original hyper edges uh -huh. that have um, at least K minus two uniquely covered elements. Okay. And then for those um, those constraints, so there must be at least one element which is blue and uniquely covered. And so, and then we have, a, we have many variables that, that are blue and uniquely covered. And then these variables will never be canceled out. So why is it the case that once you have came, a constant fraction of these and there's k minus two, there must be one that's uniquely, one variable that's uniquely uh, covered? So like each constraint, there are like, I mean, it's, uh, I mean like each blue, there are actually like at least three elements in the blue. Uh -huh. And then there are like k minus two, like variables, okay. so at least there must yeah. So this is another proof by picture. So this actually proves the lemma. So let me go to the second part of the talk. Um, uh, just so I understand the proof of the problem. Yes. So you found a set of S, which needs a lot of things to derive it, and also it's large. Yes, wait, how is eta prime related to eta? So eta. So I said like there will be, so if you look at this like set of um, eta, eta n constraints, I said there will be like some like fra constant fraction of uh, things that have uh, at least k minus, u, k minus two uniquely covered elements. So let me just call this fraction beta. Then eta is just a, uh, eta prime is just eta times beta. Beta is at least a half or something. <coughs> so suppose that. I mean, yeah, so, yeah, the fact so, that S is large means that you have more than one in the proof, right? Yeah. Yes. And so this beta somehow is the same thing as like. I mean, yeah, suppose like for contradiction that yeah, we actually proved 
we, we derive this using read at most this. Okay, like it should be. Yeah, so it's a side of prime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, basically you're saying it's like a constant loss, but nothing more than that. Yeah, there, there must be like eight. Uh, yeah, that was in late. Oh yeah, okay, so you're, yeah, I'm happy. Okay. So now let me redefine the Charlotte Adams and lesser hierarchy. So T rounds of of Charlotte Adams. I'm not gonna like write the objective. So max is zero. Such that so variables are x, s, alpha, where s is a subset of n of size at most t, and alpha is a assignment to this. S variables. One. That's probably Charles Adams. And then like I just did, didn't write the objective and then I just will say that actually to satisfy, to construct a solution that satisfies every constraint, I'm gonna just say like x s alpha is a zero when this um, partial assignment s alpha doesn't satisfy, satisfy any of any linear equation. in phi. So it's a partial assignment and then we are, gonna, we are only gonna look at the equations which is completely inside this S. And then we are gonna set this value to zero if like partial assignment doesn't satisfy any of the linear. Like, I mean, how, many, how many partial assignments don't satisfy any equation? Probably a small number of them or? I mean, anyway, anyway, so like, yeah, so, so what are your questions? Wait, S, I'm just thinking like S might be. So S, uh, size of S can be at most T. Oh, and it doesn't set it, yeah. Hmm. And like, okay, so it's, if I have a linear equation which has variables not contained in S, then I definitely don't satisfy that one. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I'm only looking at those equations that are a subset of S. Yeah, what if, what if you have, like, what if only one of the, like, variables in the equation is an S and the other two or something aren't? Then, like, we don't, I mean, at least, like, then, then yeah. Then you don't satisfy it, right? Then, like, this, this S only cares about the, like, equation that it con strictly contains. Yeah. Okay. okay, so for example, like, if S is three variables and those variables are contained in an equation, yeah, it can and be. Alpha is like an unsatisfying assignment, then the single will be zero. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so that was like Charles Adams. And then I wanted to. You said the remaining subject? Like you've. No, this, this, this is just like an extra constraint. Yeah, these are pretty static. Actually, yeah, so I, actually yeah, I think that when you write this program, yeah, you don't do this like re resolution, probably, so like probably any constraint, I, I should say. But yeah, but I just wanted to say like the constraint we are gonna construct yeah. will satisfy that properly. And then let me write this lesser hierarchy. So T rounds. And I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna define the slightly weaker version of lesser. And so it, each variable is a vector V S alpha, where S is a most T, alpha is a.
So this will be the constraints I'm going to satisfy. So they look simple. So like, yeah, this must hold for all this. So this is really like looks similar. And actually, I think this is not the uh, like right like t rounds of the cell. You need it. To, you need to like add more consistency constraints to make sure that it's like actually t rounds. But I think I'm gonna just use this because it's uh, simpler. And then actually like two t rounds of like this weaker lesser, you'll be at least stronger than t rounds of the original lesser. So let me just use this. Sorry. Yeah. What dimensional space are the these SL physics? Um. So yeah, we can't like. So when you solve SDP, then you can't control the dimension of V. Okay. So that's the like weakness of SDPs. Well, you can always assume it's like yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like I'm saying like what what. I mean yeah. Dimension is like yeah. Dimension is like the probably number of variables. Number of variables. Um. Maybe. But it's not something I have to worry about then. Obviously. <laughs> Actually, I, I probably I, I, I mean. Oh, no, you can make it two to the two to the n. Or oh really? Oh, it, it grows that fast. Oh, I don't know. I'm just saying that's a definite number. Uh, <laughs> I think what you're saying is the number bound on the number of the value of the No, I'm saying the number of vectors is certainly number bound on the dimensionality. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, yeah. So, from the resolution, we get this set phi. And I'm going to construct vectors. So I'm going to give a lesser gap here. So I'm going to um, give a vector for each like S and alpha. So let me do some notations. So for each like two sets, S and T, of size at most small t, we say that S is equivalent to t when as symmetric difference is in phi. So phi actually like each element of phi is like the set and the right hand side, but we don't care about the right hand side. So as long as like as symmetric difference t is in phi, um, we say like s and t are equivalent. And then, then we can see that for this, um, this subset of size at most t, so this defines a equivalence relation because um, it's, if s is uh, equivalent to t and t is equivalent to s, then t equal. This is the only thing I was contradicting, right? Do you always have the empty set in? Oh, I guess you could say empty set comes 0 is always in phi. So empty set. Just, just, just yeah, like yeah. reflexive. Yeah, phi, yeah, phi, is always, phi, is, phi always contains empty set. Sure, good. Then uh, you can say that like s is also equivalent to u. The only issue is that like probably the, this is size of at most t. This is size. I mean, the only case to check is uh, whether the size of this is at most two t. But the, in the definition, it's obvious that like each size of each set is at most t, so it's gonna be in phi. So then like yeah, we completely divided this um, this uh, subsets of size t into like several equivalence classes, and then for each class. For each class, i. So i is another subset, and then like this bracket means that this is an equivalence class contains i. And so let me like let me use a notation i not to the representative of this equivalence class. So each equivalence class has a picks a one representative, and then i not means that the representative of the equivalence class that contains i. Okay, so that's we're going to do this, and then like to simplify the notation, we are going to say that so empty set will be the representative of itself. Sorry, what was p again? Sorry, what was p? this large p. Large p is a like set of equations that we derived using the resolution. And then, so another notation is that, so then um, for each i, which is like subset of n, I'm going to say pi of i is plus 1 when
So it has the same parity with the representative or not. So I'm going to define pi of i like this. And then, so finally, I'm going to construct vectors. So actually, so we have a So I not is kind of like notation that is used to. Yeah. So you, yeah, I is I is a set of variables. Yeah. And then yeah, you want to know if it, okay, the same parity as it's represented. Yes. Got it. So we're gonna explicitly construct the vectors. So we can even index the coordinates. So coordinates will be. Just uh, so basically, like each equivalence class for each equivalence set, there will be exactly one coordinate, and then so for each equivalence class, this bracket i, this let me just call that this is a. This is a vector which contain which has a only one only in the coordinate corresponding to the right equivalence set. And then and then for each i, let me call that E of i is a pi of i times this. The coordinates are not one, are one for each equivalence class. Yeah, there's like one. Okay, that notation looks like it's like one for each. It has some multiples yeah, above. Oh, here? No, no, above. Yeah, 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 above. It's oh, okay. for every set of i. I get what you're saying, though. Yeah, yeah. 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 But so, I think we all get it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Let me just do it. Okay, yeah, yeah. For, for the Actually, camera. Yeah, so let me call this fancy e to denote the set of equivalence classes. <laughs> Yeah, and then so I'm gonna like uh, so now I, uh, now I have to construct vectors. Well, actually, I'm gonna like do much more thing. So I'm gonna construct a vector. So, so just just to see where we're going with this, are we like what what are, what are these vectors for? Are they to give us solutions for? So I'm gonna like construct like this vec. So we are we have to like construct vector these vectors, okay. and then I'm gonna like explicitly give like these vectors in terms of these vectors. I see. So okay. So we're, so the like the, the grand plan of all of it is to construct like a feasible yeah. solution. Yeah. And this thing at the bottom is you defining e sub i. Yeah, e sub i. Yeah, that was the definition. Oh, was there e's? I thought they were rows. I don't know why. Oh, I don't know if they're e's. Are they e's? That makes more sense. Which which one? Is that is that? Did you write an e there? This one? No, no, below, to the left. Yeah. That's a c. Yeah, that's e. That's an e. E. That's, oh, that's an e. Yeah. Oh, you okay. thought it was a C, you thought it was a row. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry. It's, it's, sense, it's like yeah, huge E. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they are wait, huge. Wait, wait, can we pause for a second? Write some more E's for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, look, can I demonstrate actually? There we go. There we go. say. <laughs> they look the same, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 right, yeah. So, yeah, so now uh, we have to construct these vectors, and then actually I'm gonna construct like much more number of vectors. So like I'm gonna construct vector for each function f, where f is a function from like this two to the n variables to this real number. So it's like infinitely many functions. But like I'm not constructing vector for all functions. I only construct functions where like f is a t junta, meaning that f only depends on at most t variables. Yeah. Okay. And then so if I do this, then how do you get this? So then our final vector will be defined by this. So this, so this will be another function. 
such that is this is just an indicator function such that Yes. So this is just an indicator function. So, so sorry, I blinked and like, what was v of f? So v, v of s alpha, I mean. Oh, v of f. No, it's v of f. Oh, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna construct like v of f. I haven't told oh, you what oh, this. Okay. So there's some there's some function f which is a t junta. Okay. Yeah. And so then some I, function out there. Yeah. And then given that function f, there's another function f sub s comma alpha. No, no, actually, so. No, no, that's just like. No, so what I said, like, I'm going to construct like this for any function f, I'm going to construct a vector v of f. Right. And oh. then, like, a after we do this, then the, our final vector v s alpha will be the, like, this, this v of s f s alpha for this indicator function f s alpha. Okay, so it's one if x restricted to s. Okay, so this tells. F sub S alpha mm -hmm. tells you if uh, I'm going to put X, you look at S and it equals to alpha. And V is the indicator of this. Oh, so now you're telling me if I give you any F, how you're going to make a vector out of it. Yeah. yeah. That's a generic transformation that you're now going to apply to F sub S comma alpha. Yeah. Got it. And then, so, and then this is another probably redundant, but let me just, so this, um, the unit identity vector is uh, all, all one's function, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait, the all one function? Yeah, all one's function. That's clearly a T-bit <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so then like we need to like, Check three, these three things. We well, still haven't told us how to get VF from that, right? Sorry? He's going to tell us. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, what, what did you say? Sorry. You still have to tell us how to get VF from F, though, first, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, did you only define Charlie Adams to like, motivate Lasser? We're just going to yeah. the lower bound for Lasser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. So the first one, I'm okay. I haven't told you how to construct the vectors. So given f, so which is a t junta. So let me say that f depends on on some subset s, where size of s is at most t. Then we are gonna do um, the Fourier transform to write that. Yeah, John and you's favorite thing. Yeah. So you can write this. So I'm gonna like, I'm gonna explain what I mean. So for any subset t, so chi of t is another function. such that um, chi of t, given this input, is equal to okay, this, is, this is another just function. And then, so I'm going to use only two facts, just probably one fact, but let me So one fact probably at so yeah I didn't normalize properly so oh, okay so sorry oh, okay expect yeah oh yeah so yeah yeah so they these like probably everyone is familiar with free analysis right so yeah these um chi t functions. Is like different basis for the space of these like functions from f to, n, f to the n to the r, and then you can always represent any function f 
with um, this as a, its free air expansion. And then this is uh, some like constant depending on f and t. And then given this, you're finally going to construct a vector, which is v sub f, is a uh, So that's the vector. So we constructed this. Let me stare at this for a while. Yes. And then while John is um, looking at it, let me. So it is just a vector. So just a dumb question. Technically, uh, I mean, wouldn't don't don't the equivalence classes are the equivalence classes just for sets or are they for sets and pairs? Like the sets and the values? Just, just sets. Just yes. sets. Okay. So if you look at one coordinate of this vector, then it's going to be something like this. Don't you need pi at some point? Oh, the pi is in the E, so well. Yeah, so here, like pi was integrated here. So if you look at just one coordinate corresponding to one equivalence class, then you get this. Sum of D and I. Do the FS alphas have like easy to understand Fourier transforms? They are like indicator function of some. They're actually very nice. Yeah, there's like some like free coefficient in the orthogonal subspace or something like that. If it was like yeah, all like if of I took, a, took 10 minutes and looked at it carefully. Yeah, if it's all of s, if s is all of n and alpha is like the all zeros, then I think like the same. Like, it's just like the constant. Yeah, it's like the n function. <laughs> yeah. Or one of those. Or yeah. Or function. One minus the or. That's the n. Yeah. <laughs> it has a like nice representation. Yeah, I just, I don't know it. So this is just the definition. And so let me check 1, 2, and 3. So 1, we want to show that this vector is uh, just a unit vector. It just means that v of constant function is, again, unit vector. And then if you look at just a constant function, so this is a constant function, then its free expansion is another, so this function. And then, so by, by, by definition, so this is a, so this is done. I mean, so I, I think like yeah, we this this part doesn't depend on like assumption that like empty set is a representative. Yeah, just yes. somehow like made in. It's just like yeah, this this choice like only merits in the just notation. It shouldn't merit the correctness of proof. No, I guess what I'm asking is like let's say another set five comma two is in the. Is in the is it? In the, so if oh, but f hat, yeah, yeah, f hat t is always zero. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah all the other free expressions. Yeah, so there may be other things in the equivalence class we don't know, but they don't matter at all. Yeah. And then, so second thing is uh, we want to show that so we want to show this. But um, in, and then, but to show this, I first will convince you this thing, the same thing. Probably I need to quantify this. So. 
check this check this um, equality as a just a function. So there are like indicator functions and so if everyone is okay, then actually this part immediately follows because uh, the way we constructed the vector is linear, and then we have a linearity here, so we must have uh, this equality as well. And third part, so I am only want to show that Vs alpha Vt beta is zero. So when you say linear, you basically mean like V of f plus g equals V of f plus V of g, which is, is that what you mean by when you say like, um, like so the way you construct those things linear? So I, I think, so what I did was a. Uh, oh, well, they, they, they may not know that. Yeah, f hat is a linear function of, yeah, yeah. of f. So yes, yeah, that is, that would be true, yeah. So yeah, okay, I'm mm -hmm. happy, good. So actually, I, by, by linear, I just meant that like, if h is a g plus f as a function, then like yeah, 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 that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it also it matters. That's, 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 that's what I can clarify. That's what you meant. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it also matters that the f half is. A yeah, that's that's, that's, that, that's why that's true. I think. The fact that, yeah. So, I I I believe this is true, but is there like a trivial way to see number two? Like, um. That that. Yeah, so like I think like if, if you add like two if, functions. If, if the subset of x uh, that's like indexed by s equals alpha, I can just like imagine like if I expand it out to this bigger like Next subset t, th like I need to pick some like oh. other extension for it. There's one of those. That's, that's true, but here that. you're summing over all subsets, right? No, no, no. You fix a t. There's, there's, there's you have t, one of those summations for each t. Oh, so I t see. is like an s yeah. and an s prime. You look at all ways of assigning variables to this while fixing this to be alpha. Okay. And one of those must be. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was reading back. If this partial assignment and that partial assignment are inconsistent, so we want to check this. And then, nice thing about it is that if they are inconsistent in a function language, what this means is that. Like is a constantly zero function, and then you can do some like Fourier more analysis. So this is a so this quantity is equal to so for each coordinate um, This is just a definition for each coin that we solve the things. And this, if you um, put this um, summation into here, then what we can get is a whole subsets of size at most t. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, so oh, yeah. I said, yeah, <laughs> sorry, yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry. So I assume that, like, so f, so f is uh, just like this indicator function, and then g is a uh, indicator function for. This. Okay. Yeah, good question. Yeah, we like g. Don't ask. Yeah, so I think that's it. Okay, then, um, so then this is equal to. And this is just a yeah. 
summation and u over is it? It's the same thing here. Let me explain this while after finishing this. So, so is it just a inner product of that tree? Well, so I guess so. Is this is this true that f of s the Fourier coefficients of f of s comma alpha they won't have any uh, like the support of that will only contain subsets strictly oh, less than t? Yeah, because it's a t jupiter. Right. So then, isn't this trivial? Like, why do you need to do all this work? Sorry, in which step? Like in this, if if f of s alpha dot f of t beta equals zero. Yeah. Then, and we know that the Fourier coefficients are only uh, zeros after the t. So in essence, you're just multiplying the Fourier vectors now, right? Yes. So doesn't that immediately imply that t is zero? No. no. I thought. Okay. So so. Let me, let me, let me, let me, okay, so I, I must have misunderstood something. So when you take a Fourier transform of a function, like just think of the function as a vector, yeah. like 2 to the n space, uh -huh. then all you're doing is you're just doing a change of basis. So if two functions, if a fun, if two vectors are orthogonal in one basis, like why would that change? I think the only thing is like if they were the f functions that you were doing the inner product of, but we're looking at the v vectors. These v vectors are like the f things, but they have like of the some repeats because of the e's, maybe. You know, like the e's are overlapping now. Uh, and the s have the chi's. E's don't have the the chi's are like some dimensional, n dimensional, or whatever. The e's are like they compress it because they have these. Is this true? Yeah. It's because they have these equivalency classes. I see. So it's not exactly like Fourier transform, but somehow like truncated version, and then like it's like more complicated by because this of the pi thing. Okay, yeah. But uh, I guess my point was the truncation doesn't matter because we're yeah, yeah, truncation is fine. Yeah. So if it's only these pi's that's we think about. Yeah. So this is just like um, this is like one of those Fourier calculations. That yeah, it's just like manipulation. But I think like everything is uh, kind of like easy to see. And then at the end, and, actually, and then you finally use the fact that f and g, f times g is a like zero function, okay. so everything is zero here. And we're here. Okay, so if we had made t much much larger, if t was too large, t t is like eta times n, right? Yeah. So where would this fail if t is too large? I mean, actually, it fails in the resolution. So somewhere here, somewhere here, we use the resolution proof. Where do we use it? In constructing S and alpha. Why? Wow. Because this equivalency class was defined in terms of the resolution proofs. But the resolution proof, I can define it for. I mean, I can define those equivalency classes. Yeah, but they'll also contain empty set and one in that case, and then it would be able to find. Actually, so like, yeah, if uh, if if we we like drive the like contradiction. Then the like, choice of pi is kind of like not well defined. Yeah. Because at that point you you have n t set in one and you have n t set in zero. Uh, so you have that's like you can get pi to be zero. Uh, yeah, I think we use that, that fact and then this and then phi is somehow like, close under addition. So does it say that like resolution in this case is stronger? Or at least it's yeah, yeah, like it's it, this proof is really modularized. So like, if you have a like expansion, then you immediately get resolution. Then you get if you get resolution, if you immediately get the cellular wrong. I see. That's, this is like much simpler than I thought it would be. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So so what did what did the Kuntari paper like? Why did this not work for them? Like what was? Oh, I guess here like where you mean use the BCK. Yeah, right. the BCK thing. I think this will. So, so where did we use the fact that we have a dual as opposed to not have a dual? So I think if you just have a pairwise independence and that subgroup, like actually this like linear is in linear equation, like each like constraint, like hugely depends on the fact that like p is a subgroup. 
So when like pieces are just like pairs independent, but like that subgroup, then we this machinery like breaks from the beginning. And then actually like so. So, so, so okay, you you said there were three modular steps. One is once you get expansion, then you get resolution, and then you can construct these vectors. So, but they, but yeah. So if you are this subgroup and resolution, uh -huh. then you get a. Oh, sorry, you repeat that. Huh. So. Yeah, so I think like, I pretty much assume that like, mm -hmm. so each constraint, I mean, like predicate is a subgroup, which means that, which means that it can be represented as a linear equation. Ah, Actually, I only define the resolution proof only for the linear equations. And the, this completely fails in the... Yeah, when like P is a pairwise independent, but that subgroup, then actually it's, I mean, it's not even clear how to... So actually, so like, yeah, the proof of uh, even like Sherrill Adams gap for pairwise independent predicate is uh, kind of like not comparable to this. I see. And then like, then BCK took that approach and then I proved that's PSD using completely different method. That's it.